So Ephesians 3 and verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. When I was a young boy, my family went to the seaside. And when we arrived at the beach, my sisters and I, very keen to get in the sea, were undressed and in our costumes in no time. Those who were older, that bit slower perhaps, to enter into the fray. I jumped into the sea and started splashing around and very soon I experienced what I always used to experience with just flesh and bones, no muscle on me, was the fact that, boy, this is cold. <laughs> so looking forward to it, now wanting to get out so quickly. But then I caught a glimpse out of the corner of my eye of my sister. And she had gone the other side of the breaker. And she had gone into the sea. And she'd taken a couple of steps into the water when suddenly she was gone. Completely submerged under the water. I don't want to draw light on the fact that my father was the hero of the day. Um, and was in the sea within a, a few seconds or even a split second in a sense. But that's what happened. But I mentioned the illustration for this point. That in this passage, in Ephesians, I feel like the little boy who's been paddling in the sea, but then suddenly, like his sister, has foolishly gone the wrong side of the breaker and has just been submerged under the deep, deep water. I can honestly say, I do not know how to bring this passage to you. I don't know how to do it. To my comfort is the fact that none other than Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said words that were very similar. I have suggested to you, and I must just say, I lean very heavily upon him for support this morning. I must say to you, or rather I have said to you in the past when we've looked at this, that I believe these words, this passage, this prayer of Paul is amongst the most needy things for the church in our generation. The fulfilment of the words of Paul's prayer for us is the most vital, it's the most pressing need for us as individual Christians and for the churches in our land today. And sadly, when I look for help for modern commentaries upon these verses, there's much that's good. Their exegesis, exegesis is, is largely sound. And there's little pithy statements that I could quote to you that are, are quite good, quite catch me phrases. Quite pick me up phrases. Good stuff, there's solid stuff in there. But what is lacking? What is lacking? 
And I think where you have to go back to the kind of older school of thinking, to some of the men of old, to fulfil what is lacking. What is lacking in what many have to say is an experiential knowledge of these things for themselves. Because in these verses, we're not talking about mere head knowledge. And I've conveyed to you before, and I don't wish to go over it all again, but the earlier prayer in chapter 1 was for that head knowledge, but with the spirit of wisdom and revelation, to be imparted to the heart. And that, that would be a great, rich tool for strengthening of the Christian. But here, Paul's prayer goes beyond... Even heart knowledge. Because as I suggested to you last time, when we come to the verse, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, what we've come to there is the experience of Christ, wherein he becomes more real to you as a person than he ever was before. And as real to you, as I suggested last time, as a person who's sitting to your right or to your left this morning. That is, that is the kind of... Those are the... Or that is the experience that Paul is praying for in these verses. Now those of you who are clever, <laughs> those of you who uh, recall, as we've been going through Ephesians, what I had to say in chapter 1, Spoke there in chapter 1 and verse 14, or verse 13, really, um, about the seal of the Holy Spirit. And I suggested at that time that the seal of the Holy Spirit, and again you have to look to the older school of thinking here, because today many people would teach that the seal of the Holy Spirit is something that happens when you believe. And it's really just saying about the Holy Spirit coming uh, at the point of believing, regeneration if you will, and he comes and dwells within your heart. That's the seal of the Spirit. And there's a sense in which that's true. And there's a sense in which that is what Paul is saying there. But there's a sense also in which he's adding more to that there. Because he says, having believed, and that is a literal, literally correct as the NIV, NIV puts it there, chapter 1 verse 13, having Having believed, after you were believed, after you believed, sorry, you were marked in him with a seal. And so I spent some time talking about that as being where the Holy Spirit, subsequent to conversion, he dwells within a person's heart, a believer's heart, at conversion. And so in a sense, yes, you are sealed. But I believe also that Paul has in mind there, that there are times, well there is a time, subsequent to believing, where the Christian has this encounter with the Holy Spirit, this experience of the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon them, wherein they are sealed. Some people talk about it as a, a baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, having put that to you before, what is Paul now praying for? When he says in verse 17 that he may strengthen you, uh, sorry, uh, well, yeah, through his spirit, he may strengthen you through his, with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I'm talking to, I'm saying to you that this is the utmost in a sense. This is encountering Christ experientially as a very real person. And so the question really is, well, what do I mean by that? What do I mean? And is that, how is that different to what we were talking about when we were talking about the seal of the Holy Spirit? And I have to be, well I hope I'm always honest with you, I don't know. I don't know. We are in territory that is so sublime in the richness, in the fullness of what is being conveyed, that only the person who has walked there can truly begin to know something of what Paul is praying in these verses. And that is why, without any hesitation, I say to you, I lean heavily on Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones for the interpretation of what is being said here. Because I believe, though he didn't speak much about these things, I believed he encountered very much 
what is spoken of in these verses. And indeed, what was spoken of in verse 13 of chapter 1. There's a sense in which there isn't a great deal of difference. Because we are talking about Christian experience. And all Christian experience from God is a triune experience of God, isn't it? Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But just from the point of view of doctrine and to divide things up, because we like to do that, we like to have our, our systems and, and, and to try and comprehend things, and it's not a, an unreasonable thing to want to do. We're talking in verse 13 of the Holy Spirit. An encounter with the Holy Spirit, sealing the heart of a believer. And it's a bit, a bit like a believer... A bit like someone who's, I'll use my um, seaside analogy again, someone who's in the water, in the sea, and they're kind of mooching around as it were, they're walking around in the sea, maybe they're up to their knees and they're paddling along in the sea, and it's great, they're having a great time, but suddenly, perhaps unexpectedly, a giant wave comes and sweeps over them and knocks them off their feet. The seal of the Holy Spirit. The wave goes... What remains? What remains? Well, if I've only gone into the sea up to my knees, the rest of my body is dry. But now I, I'm saturated. I'm saturated, aren't I? I've been fully immersed, as it were. And that stays with me. And I would suggest to you that that kind of experience for the Christian, that experience of the Holy Spirit is, is a kind of brings to the believer a real assurance. Yes, they knew they were saved. Yes, they have maybe they've had some kind of conversion experience. Maybe it was gradual. Maybe it was years ago. They, they never really could point, pinpoint the hour. But they know they're a believer. They know whom they believed. I am his, he is mine. But there's these still these, these kind of doubts, there's these uncertainties, and sometimes they look in their heart and they think, can I really be saved? Can I really be a Christian? And maybe, and put it in its worst degree, there are those of us who have struggled and who do, do struggle with this whole question of assurance. Am I truly His? And I know Christians who, even to their last days, struggle. Now, to, to you and I looking at them, we think, there's no question in our mind. We look at the change in their life. We look at the way they are. There's no question that he or she is not a believer to us. Not that we're their judge. But they, they show us so much by way of fruit. Fruit of the Spirit. But to them, there's this great uncertainty. Now the seed of the Holy Spirit, in a great measure, brings that assurance to them that goes beyond the just the reference in scripture or the understanding of scripture. And just like the person who is in the sea, he's there on his knee, up to his knees, and the wave comes over, gets him off his feet, and he's back up again. Um, he doesn't dust himself down, but you know, he's all covered in water. But as he, he carries on in the sea, another wave can come. Turns his back, people are perhaps laughing at him from the shore, you know, we're thinking now of someone at the sea, so um, let's leave it at that. But he looks back, people are laughing, but what he doesn't see is there's another wave coming. This kind of encounter with the Holy Spirit is something that can be repeated. You look in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit. Now, en masse like that, where the Holy Spirit comes in that power, well, that's what we would. Today gives the term revival. But it happens on an individual basis. Yes, it's a personal revival for you or for me when a person experiences that, that themselves. But when a whole congregation, a whole group of believers experience it, that's a revival. That's a revival in a church. Or if it spreads across the land, that's a revival in the land. The Holy Spirit is being poured out. Now these Ephesian Christians, they had experienced something of that. Because Paul says, having believed, you are marked in him with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit. 
And as I said to you before, on the one hand, that is something that happens when a person believes. The Holy Spirit comes and yes, you're sealed, you're his. But Paul has more in mind there than which I've just been putting to you. And he says this of them. How does he say this of them? Why does he say this of them? Because in those New Testament times, in the formation of the church, this kind of experience, this kind of encounter with the Holy Spirit was happening all over. Because it was days of revival as we would understand it today. Paul would go to a place, he would preach, and what would people do? People would get their scrolls, those who were into black arts and such things. And though they would in today's terms cost thousands of pounds, because they got all sorts of so-called magic formulae on them, they would throw them in the fire. That's transformation. That's something that can only happen with a real work of the Holy Spirit, power of the Holy Spirit. And you see through the New Testament, through Acts, those kind of things happening. Demonstrations of the Spirit and His power, says Paul to one church in his letter to them. A demonstration of the Spirit and of His power. And I would suggest to you that wherever Paul was going, that was what he was experiencing. And so therefore, he can say with a confidence that that was the experience of the church in Ephesus. But here we come to this verse that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith now what is the difference what is the difference between what Paul has said in verse 13 of chapter 1 about the seal of the Holy Spirit the encounter with the Holy Spirit and what's the difference with Christ dwelling in your heart in your heart through faith now I've put to you before that this is Paul praying to believers and as a believer if the Holy Spirit dwells in your heart the triune God therefore Christ dwells in your heart and I quoted you when we looked at that originally, verses to back that up. That the interrelationship of the, of the Trinity, three persons, but one God. And where one is present, all are present. Jesus had said how the Father and I, those whom we love, we will come and we will make our abode with them. How does he do that? Through the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit is present, Christ is present. So if you're a believer this morning, the Holy Spirit, sorry, Christ does dwell in your heart because the Holy Spirit dwells in your heart. But Paul is praying that he would. And so as I suggested to you before, and I repeat, what Paul, what Paul is praying here is for his very real felt presence. The real reality, the sense of reality of Christ as a person to you. Beyond mere doctrinal understanding, if I put it that way. Beyond mere knowledge, experience of all the richness of Christ. Now, when a person is in sea and they are paddling, Walking out to go deeper. Maybe you've been to the sands, haven't you? You can walk out, it seems, for miles. And it only goes, well, it doesn't really go above your ankles much, but it takes, it seems to take about half a mile before it gets up to your knees and so on. But there is some. And they're walking out into the sea. And maybe they've experienced that giant wave that's come upon them. And it's knocked them off their feet, but they've got back up again. And they're still in the kind of relative shallows. But then as they're walking out, suddenly what happens? is that the sea gets very deeper. I have to say it in the right way, in that the, the, the bank is dropping away, isn't it? That's how it happens. The bank is dropping away. The sea suddenly gets very quickly, much, much deeper. And if you remained just standing and you didn't do anything about it, you would go under. And so what you have to do is you have to swim. Because in terms of standing on your feet, you are out of your depth. Now I suggest to you that what Paul has in mind, and what Paul is praying for, the seal of the Spirit is like the giant wave that comes and knocks you off your feet. Christ dwelling in your heart through faith is like being in the deeper waters of the sea. So yes, the waves will come upon you as it were, but now you've got to swim. You've got to swim. You can no longer stand on your feet, you've got to swim because there's so much depth. And that's the reality of the presence of Christ. But there's something more. And 
this is what makes it so rich and so wonderful. Is as I said to you before that that word dwell. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. We looked at that before. And we, we, I, I was pointing out to you, reminding you of the fact that God, he dwelt in the tabernacle. Part of my own personal reading this morning. He came to the tent where Moses was. He dwelt in that tabernacle. Then later on he dwelt in the temple. But this was temporary. And now, he dwells in our hearts. That's what we were looking at there. But then I went on to point out, and now I come back to this again, that this word dwell in here, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that it has about it, not a temporiness like the tabernacle, which is gone, or even the temple, but a permanence, a permanence. And so it's rather like you're walking on the edge of the sea, and then you're picked up, and you're dropped in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Now you have to be careful here, because you'll think of drowning and all the rest of it. Don't, don't go that side of it. Go the side I'm trying to bring of it. The richness of it. All around you is the Pacific Ocean. In a lifetime? Could you swim if you were put in the middle of it? Could you swim to America or Australia or wherever it is? Either side of there? I don't know. I don't know. But if you could, then take it beyond that. Have triple the Pacific Ocean. Have a, a world that's full of the Pacific Ocean. Get out of that. <laughs> this is what we're talking about. This encounter with Christ is permanent. Permanent. So on the one hand, the seed of the Spirit brings an assurance. But now we're talking about a richness of communion with God in Christ. That will stay with the believer forever. And brings a much calmer frame. Brings a much settled heart. Brings a much settled, much more settled walk with God. Maybe it doesn't have the, um, the zeal, well, that's not the right word, but maybe, here's, here's an example where someone, he's fallen in love. He's, and this is actually a Martin Lloyd-Jones illustration, but here's someone who's fallen in love. And he can't stop thinking about her, he can't stop talking about her, and she's everything to him. And he has such desire, such passion, and such love for her. Over the years, that initial ardour, that initial passion, dies down. Actually, if you read a book by C.S. Lewis, it's called The Four Loves. And he talks about that. He calls it Eros. Eros is a wow love. The, you know, the, the black magic love, as it were. You know, the, the milk tray love, where the man will ski across the mountains in his black thingy bob. And, you know, all because the lady loves milk tray. He'll do anything for her. Will he do it ten years down the road? That's the question. Eros, says C.S. CS, CS Lewis, is the most powerful of these four loves that he talks about. But it's the most fleeting in a sense. In that that passion dies down. And so we might equate, might equate here that in terms of what one might feel. The seal of the Holy Spirit. A bit like that initial love. How, it, how when he comes to your heart in that way. The, that initial love welling up. That great zeal as it were. But then, what happens with the couple? It's genuine love. That eros, that initial passion has died down. But what happens? It's a good relationship. And it matures like a good wine. <laughs> and so, in a sense, though there isn't a, oh, look at my wife, if I can be crude, and I'm sorry for, for that, but that's the only way I can kind of convey it. Um, that perhaps isn't there so much. But what's there is something that is mature. Like a stilton. <laughs> something that is mature. But something that is richer. Something that is deeper. Because what happens is, you go on Mr. and Mrs. when you've been married five minutes. Who won when we did Mr. and Mrs.? We did. You lost. <laughs> Susan and I won. Tim and Lisa lost. Why is that? Well, because we've, we've been many years down the road, as it were. And had we taken on uh, Paul and Elaine, we'd have probably been trounced by them. But the thing is, that 
initially. Yes, you've got that great passion at work. But you don't really know that much about each other. But as life goes on together, a richer and a more mature, a settled heart. You don't necessarily sing and well, I keep going over the same ground, I'll leave that. But just, you know, that's what's happening. That's what's happening here. Is that when Christ, as it were, comes, when he dwells in your heart through faith, it's like going out into those deeper waters. It's a richer experience. Your knowledge of him. And this is the prayer, isn't it? That you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and high and deep and uh, long and deep is the love of Christ. To know this love. To know it. To richer, fuller, deeper understanding of this love. A love that actually surpasses knowledge. So here you are. You see, again, I, I make no excuses for my saying at the start, I'm out of my depth. I'm out of my depth. I don't know what I'm saying. I do know what I'm saying, but I, you know what I mean? I, I, I don't know the fullness of how to say it. And even Paul doesn't, because he says it surpasses knowledge. I have, to my comfort, not only Martin Lloyd-Jones floundering for words, but I have the Apostle Paul too. And he was caught up to the third heaven. So I've got a good support in that way. He dwells, and it's a permanency. And this through faith. And as I said to you last time, what happens? Faith is being sure of what we be, uh, sure of what we hope for. No, it's not. It's being certain of what we hope for and sure of what we believe. I think I've got that right now, haven't I? <laughs> I look to Elaine for inspiration. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we believe. Hebrews 11.1. 1. I might have got it around the wrong way. But the point is this. Is that there can be little faith. And little faith is doubtful faith. But strong faith is sure. Strong faith is certain. When Christ dwells in your hearts, in the way I'm trying to convey, which I can't convey, it's through faith. And what happens is that that faith that maybe was weak becomes immeasurably strong. It is strengthened beyond understanding, in a sense. So that you can say, I'm certain... I'm sure. And when we looked at that last week, we've looked at everything last week now, haven't we? When we looked at that last week, I quoted you some verses where writers in the Bible said, We know. You can't say we know, you must say we believe. They say we know. It's through faith that they know, but their faith is so strong, it's true. They know the reality of these things. There's no doubting in their mind. And why is that? It is because, and certainly in the Apostle Paul's case, they knew what it was to have Christ dwelling in their hearts through faith. And so their faith, his faith was so strong that he knew. He knew. He knew these things to be so. And then we move on. That it's through faith and then he says, second part of that verse, I pray that you be rooted and established in love. Now that's an open-ended thing because then it takes us into verse 18, which we're not going there this morning. But I'm just going to take those words, rooted and established. Paul says, and I pray that you, which makes it sound like it's a, another kind of petition, but it's not. In the literal, and I pray that you isn't there. It's the consequence, the Rooting and the establishing is the consequence of Christ dwelling in your heart, dwelling in your heart through faith. And that then leads to this next thing that you would have power. Because Christ is dwelling, you have power to grasp with all the saints who experience Christ in this way. And so the rooting and established is connected with the Christ, with Christ dwelling in your heart through faith. And so that word rooted, think of that, that's a, a rich word, isn't it? Rooted. When my wife gets a plant and she pots it. So that plant, 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 she pots it. She does pot it. It dies. Sometimes. <laughs> Much to the annoyance of someone not far, far, far from me. But when you get a plant and you bed it, 
in good soil. And you bed it deep. What happens? It grows, doesn't it? It grows. And it remains strong. Think of a tree. Think of a tree. What does a tree do? A tree is rooted. A good, strong tree. When the winds come, in fact, we had strong winds, as you all know, uh, this, this last year, and we had some, a man and a woman come to investigate the trees outside our house, and I was rather hoping they would say they're going to cut them all down, because I like trees, but, um, well, they're a nuisance right outside your house. But he said, oh no, this is a hornbeam, he said. This is strong, and this will have roots that are as long as the branches. I thought, great, that means it's under the foundations of my house. <laughs> but the point being, some trees that aren't well rooted, what happens? Strong wind will blow them down. But if they've got good roots in good soil, and they've got down deep, bedded themselves down deep, they're going to remain firm. Will your anchor hold? In the storms of life, there's a different um, metaphor, but will your anchor hold in the storms of life? Will your tree stand firm when the hurricane blows? Will it? Now apply that to your heart. Apply that to your Christian life. Being rooted in Christ. If Christ dwells in your heart through faith, then this rooting, is so much the stronger. Now, of course, if you are in Christ, and this is where, as I say, it's very hard to, to convey the, the fullness of what Paul is saying here because there's much that crosses over into what we hold firmly to. In that if I am his and he is mine, then I'm buried in good soil, as it were. If I'm a Christian, it's the seed has gone down into good soil and I'm well rooted and I'm going to grow. You know, we, we hold to those things as part of our, 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 our um, sanctification, as it were. To bring this out, to live a, uh, live a godly life. But at the same time, we can say, we can be stunted. We can not grow as we should. We can not enter into the fullness of the Christian life that is available to us. Who do you know? Who do you know living around you today who knows what Paul is praying for here? Who do you know who has had this real encounter with Christ in that way? It has to make a difference to how one lives. It has to. Remember I said, never last week, this was actually two weeks ago, but I quoted Spurgeon on this, saying that there's a point in grace where the Christian is as much above, like where a Christian is taken as much above an ordinary Christian as a non-Christian is from a believer. Now if you didn't get that, you didn't grasp it before, let me come at it again. There's the unsaved person, there's the believer. They've been brought to life. There's an immeasurable distance, a distance between them, says Spurgeon. One's dead, the other one's alive, spiritually. But he's also saying that in the spiritual life, there is so much richness available for the Christian. Experientially, there is an encounter with God. There is the experience of God that is so rich and so immense that it takes a Christian so much above the ordinary realm of Christianity as to seem as though they've had another conversion experience. And what do you know of those things? What do I know of those things? Have you tasted something of this? And if you have, surely it makes you desire more. Remember Paul says this is available for all. He even goes on to pray, doesn't he? To say, may have power to give of all the saints. And this is to the church in Ephesus. It's not to the deacons and elders alone. It's to men, women alike. And such a one who is rooted, he's not going to be blown over. In other words, the Christian who is well rooted, who has this encounter with Christ, the roots will be that much stronger. And the growth will be that much better, perhaps more rapid. But certainly, the standing will be firm. The storms of life will come all around. 
things will be taken away, but such a one will stand firm. It comes to mind Psalm 91, but I can't quite recall the verses. I'm not going to turn them now, but Psalm 91 I think would be applicable in this. That all around is turmoil, all around all are falling, but he stands firm, rooted in Christ. And then we have the word established. Established, which actually the literal, it can mean established, but the literal is more grounded. And so here we might think of a building. And if I haven't told you before, I will tell you now, you can laugh at my expense, the time when I decided I was going to build a wall. And I knew nothing about building, and I didn't dig a foundation. I just put some cement on the ground and shoved some breeze blocks on top, which were lying there, cemented them all in. All looked very good to me. A friend came round and started talking to me, and then he put his hand on it, and the whole thing collapsed. The whole thing collapsed. Why was that? I said, it's because it's not dry. Cement hasn't dried. But then when he looked, he said, we haven't got a foundation. <laughs> it's got to be established, hasn't it? You've got to have a foundation. And of course, our foundation is Christ. And he is the rock on which we stand. And if you're a believer this morning, you may not know the fullness of what Paul is praying here. You are established in Christ. That is a fact. You're rooted and you're established in him, certain. But Paul is praying for more. He's praying for a greater establishing, in a sense. Why would you need a greater establishing? Because it's going to be a greater building. If I'm building a tower that's that wide, I don't need uh, such a great foundation. It's if I'm building a building that is the size of this room. And it's going to go up ten times the height of this room. Be a stunted Christian by all means. And stick with a measly little foundation. If that's what you've got. But let's not be like that. Let's make these words, these, this prayer of Paul's, something that we would say as Jacob, I will not let you go, Lord, until you do this in me. I want to know Christ. Paul said that, didn't he? I want to know Christ. Paul, you were caught up in the third heaven and you're saying you want to know Christ. Yes, because even though I've experienced Christ dwelling in my heart through faith, even though I've been rooted and established in love, even though I've experienced all these things immeasurably, I've only just begun. I've only just begun. You cannot outdo Christ in this. Isn't that wonderful? cannot outdo Christ. And so the building that is established it's not going to fall down. It's not going to fall down. Temptation comes. Trial and tribulation. It's the same thing as applied with the rooted, isn't it? Founded in Christ. Established in Him. Grounded in Him. You see when Christ becomes so real to a person, and again, I'm, I'm going into waters where I'm drowning, I'm drowning in saying this, because I, I don't know how to say it. But when Christ becomes so real to a person, as real as the person who is next to you this morning, then that becomes your greatest means. He becomes your greatest means of sanctification. Don't do this. Don't do that. Here's our rules and regulations of the church. Why haven't you got a hat on? Why aren't you wearing a tie? Yeah, whatever it might be. Whatever it might be. And some of these things may or may not be good. But the point is this. When we try, when we try our list of do's and don'ts, it's so easy to make, and it might not necessarily be wrong to, to follow such a thing. There are things a Christian shouldn't do. There are things a Christian should do, of course. But when we're trying to grow as saints, when we're trying to increase in terms of sanctification, my greatest motive for saying no to the world, my greatest motive for switching off, as it were, the world, my greatest motive for saying no to temptation. My greatest motive for fleeing from it is not my list of do's and don'ts. Because that can very easily become a, a, a proud-hearted um, elitism. 
legalistic ways. My greatest motive is Christ. Isn't it? But if Christ is only up here and a little bit down there, if it's nine tenths that Christ is up here and only one tenth that he's down here, I'm going to struggle. And I'm going to give in to temptation again and again. I'm going to struggle. I need my list of do's and don'ts. I need to train myself. And well, we should. But when Christ is nine tenths in the heart, that is my greatest incentive. Because I love him. He's real to me. And I don't want to offend him. Would you slap? Would you slap the person you love the most? Would you slap them in hatred and anger? Can you get within you a hatred or an anger towards a person you love dearly? And yet we can so easily fall into sin. And when we sin, it's as though we do that. It's as though we say, I don't care about you. What is our greatest incentive to say no to sin? It's Christ dwelling in the heart through faith, rooted and established. And finally, he says, in love. In love. You may not like football. I'll confess, I was watching the other night some of the World Cup and one of the uh, men who was the expert uh, was talking about how this certain player, this certain striker, he wanted to be loved. He wanted to be loved by his manager. And he wanted to be loved by the people. And it's only if he feels that they love him can he score a goal. That was effectively what they were saying. And I thought, so it's got nothing to do with the uh, £150,000 a week he gets or whatever it is he gets. Because this particular one, I can't even remember his name now, but I think he was some so-called superstar. But there's a truth there, isn't there? Not necessarily with football, leave that aside. If you don't feel loved, then that, I would suggest more than anything, you can have all the money in the world. You can have all the tea in China. Were the whole world mine? But I had not Christ. No, we've gone too far. Were the whole world mine, but I lived in it alone, I would be the most miserable person ever. Were I to have all the riches of the world, but have no one to love me, that would be a tragedy, wouldn't it? That surely has to be the bitterest pill. To have no one care for you. No one whatsoever loving you. I'm not talking about marriage now. I'm talking about having anyone. No one for you. No one who cares. No one to whom you can share any burden. What an emptiness. What a real emptiness that is. Yet to be loved. Yet we go back to our earlier illustration of the, the young man who's smitten with the girl. And he wants to marry her. And she said yes. You know, he's jumping all over the place, isn't he? He's leaping for joy. And uh, you know, he gets his even foolishly, though he's a man who doesn't do these things, but he picks up a flower. She loves me, she loves me not. And even though it comes on, she loves me not. He, ah, he throws it away, she loves me, he says. Because he knows she loves him. Because she said yes, he's loved. And he'd do anything. He'd go through the flames. Because he's loved. And work, which was before, well, it's nothing now. Now, I'm sure you've had something of that kind of experience yourself. Now transfer that to the love of God that is there for you in Christ Jesus. Being rooted and established. Christ dwelling in your heart through faith. Being rooted and established in what? In him, yes, but in him, in his love. In his love. That immeasurable love which we will see God willing another time. The depth and the width and the height and the length of it. It's love. Now to know you're loved by a person Gives you strength to do things, to face certain tasks. But how about this? To know that you're loved by Almighty God. To know that Christ Jesus loves you. To know that he's dwelling in your heart through faith. To know that you have experienced him, you are experienced him in a settled way, that he is a real person to you. 
And again, I say, I'm, I'm into the realms of mystery here because these are things too much to convey. But to know her love gives you the strength to do anything. And that is why, and that is why we can read our church history and we must read our church history. We can read our church history and we can read of so many who have been willing to die for the Lord because they have known that he loves them. That's the reason. And they've known that love in a measure, to a degree, of what Paul is praying for here with all the saints. To be able to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Now what do we know of these things? And I come back to where I started. To say this is what we need. This is what our church needs. For us to know this richer, deeper intimacy with Christ. And I don't want to repeat myself, but just to say I am repeating myself now. The more we know this, the less the world. The more we know this, the more the world will take an interest. Because the world will see a power there. A power in our lives. And the more we know this, the greater the glory we bring to God. And the greater our walk with Him. And the greater our love to Him. Who loved us. And gave Himself for us. We're going to come to these emblems. Very short. This is a visible reminder, isn't it? It's like a drama that we act out. We take the bread and we act out the body of Christ being given for us. We take the cup, we take the wine and we act out the blood of Christ being poured out for our sin. Why did he do that? Because he loves us. He loves us. And every one of us may know more and more and may know something of what it is to have Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith. And let's pray now that as we partake of these elements, let's pray that something of this love of Christ will be richer in us even as we partake.